welcome to everyone this evening. We're so glad to have you in service with us tonight. And uh, I know we have several guests this evening uh, because of the baby dedication. So we are thrilled to have you with us this evening. If you're watching us online, wherever you may be watching from, we, uh, we welcome you as a part of this service as well. And uh, I know few of you won't recognize him or his name, but for those that will, good to have Brother Fred Bishop in service with us this evening. Amen. Brother Richard Bishop, one of Brother Richard Bishop's brothers, and uh, I don't want to sort of date him and his wife, but they... They used to keep me sometimes when I was a little kid, so uh, go back a, a long ways. Amen. Praise God. Would you stand? And uh, if you turn to Genesis chapter 13, I will say, uh, I know those of you that are, were here this morning are aware of this, but I uh, was not in service this morning due to not feeling well and to be very honest, if it wasn't a baby dedication this evening, I wouldn't be here. But I consider this one of my privileges to get to be a part of baby dedications, and so I am here. And uh, I will not be doing the norm of anointing the babies. I will give someone else that opportunity. And then the thing I will miss the very most about the evening is my chance to get to hold each child and get a picture, but I don't want to risk whatever I think I may have going on to spread it, so uh, in respect of all of you, I will be maintaining my distance. There's some several people here I see I would love to get to greet and talk to you, but I don't want to, I don't want to share, um, so I will probably be slipping out as soon as is reasonable. Um, so, um, just want to kind of let you know that. Genesis chapter 13, you know, I, I really, I was thinking about it today, and for years, uh, we, we've just, baby dedications were just kind of a part of the service. We took a few minutes, prayed, that was it. And then, for several years now, as a part of this congregation, we've, We've made it more than that. It's it's really kind of the focal point of the service when we do it. But as I was thinking today, and I feel like the Lord gave me a message for this service several weeks ago, we, we say it's a baby dedication, but the truth of the matter is I'm not, I think there's value in dedicating a baby. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not sure how much value there is in dedicating a baby if parents aren't dedicated to the Lord. We know, we believe Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus chose uh, Mary to be the one that would carry the baby and birth the baby. But have you ever thought about the fact that God had placed significant trust in Mary and Joseph. Not that they would just simply carry the child for nine months and be responsible for his birth, but that as parents, they would live the lives necessary for him to become who he was supposed. He couldn't have, he couldn't have done when, when, he, when John... When he went to be baptized and John said, I need to be baptized of you. And, and Jesus said, this, this is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. That, that wasn't the first thing Jesus needed to do. One of the things was to be taken to the temple eight days after. He, just because he was God manifested in the flesh, he was still an infant. He couldn't get to the temple by himself. He had to have parents that were dedicated and committed to the plan and the purpose of God for him. And so I, 
come tonight, as I guess I've done several times now, as we will dedicate these children, but also sometimes maybe it's a word of encouragement, sometimes it's a word of challenge, but to the parents of these children, but I think I probably have said this in times past, I hope and pray that what I feel to share for the next little bit here, that every parent, whether you're dedicating a child tonight or not, would open your heart and spirit to what the Lord might say to us this evening. So Genesis chapter 13, I'll begin reading with verse number 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled, th dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, there, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you will depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other, and Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Verse number 7 tells us that there was, there was an issue between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle, or Abram at this time still, Abram's cattle and Lot's cattle. And so this division is going to take place and the Bible says that verse 11, Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Verse 10 says, excuse me, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. Now I had a couple of typos in my notes on Thursday evening so I want to point out I know that these two words do not start with the same letter. I want to preach to you for a few minutes this evening on this subject, this question. Cattle or kids? Cattle or kids? Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the privilege of being in your presence this evening. Thank you for another opportunity to join together with people of like precious faith. First off, to lift up and exalt the name that is above every name. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for that privilege, Lord. God, as we come tonight with this wonderful occasion of these children that you've given to these families and giving them back to you, dedicating them to you, God, I pray that this would be more than just some kind of ceremonial ritual we go through. I pray, God, that it would be more than just something we do because we think we're supposed to do, but... God, I pray that there would be a divine, supernatural work of your Spirit in this place this evening. That your Spirit would work in our hearts and our lives tonight. I pray that you would give us ears to hear tonight what you would desire to say. Hearts that are open to receive. I trust you tonight. I depend on you. Without you, I can do nothing. I need you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. There are a few things about this passage, this scenario especially, that I don't know that I fully understand. First of all, when God called Abram, when He initially called him, He instructed him, I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your family. I think perhaps in the purest sense of that explanation, when Abram left, it was supposed to be just he and Sarah. However, the Bible says that Lot, his nephew, went with 
him. And so it's these this is these are some circumstances that perhaps would not have been encountered if Abraham would have done as the Lord had said and just simply him and Sarah left. I I I I don't understand why Abraham did that. Again, it seems to be that God intended for just him and Sarah to depart alone, but they find themselves now in this, this conflict, this conflict between Abram and all of his cattle and his herdmen and Lot and all of his. And they were growing, they were expanding, and the contention between them was increasing. So Abram decides we, we, need, to, uh, we need some separation. There's, there's plenty of land, there's plenty of opportunity here for us, so we Instead of continuing to fight amongst ourselves, let's, let's just kind of go our separate ways here. The thing that I really don't understand in this scenario is why Abraham, again at this time still Abram, but why Abraham left the decision up to Lot. I also don't understand why Lot did not defer to Abraham. Because as the young man, he should have realized, I don't always make the right decisions in my youth and, and in my lack of experience. There are, some things that, there are some things that you will only get through experience. I, I believe we can learn from the mistakes of others. I believe there's some heartache and pain that we don't have to go through individually if we will learn from others. But at the end of the day, there's some things you got to get your own experience in to develop and increase your wisdom. And so Lot, I don't think he had that yet. And for some reason, he chose to accept the offer to make the choice first. With regards to Abraham, I don't know if Abra, from Abraham's perspective, he was just going to put it in God's hands, hoping that somehow whatever decision Lot made would be the best decision for him. I, I think I would suspect that that was some degree of Abraham's thought. I'm, I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to give Lot the opportunity to choose, but ultimately I'm going to trust God that whatever's best for me is is what's going to happen. And so he, he, he makes that offer to Lot and, and expresses to him, let's, let's go our separate ways and I want you to decide, Lot. I want you to choose which direction you're going to go. I, I want you to have first choice. And in verse 9 again he says, that, that Abraham says, it's not the whole land before us, so separate thyself. You, you go one way, I'll go the other. And so... Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. He sees the options that are available, and all he's thinking about is his cattle. He sees the well watered plains of Jordan, and he's thinking about all this cattle he has What's going to be best for him and his cattle? What's going to be the best scenario for my herdsmen to continue taking care of my cattle so that they can be fed and they can grow and, and, and I can continue to become more and more well off than I already am? And so he looks at the well-watered plains of Jordan, and he ignores the fact that the well-watered plains of Jordan have an attachment to Sodom and Gomorrah. He looks at the well-watered plains of Jordan, but for some reason he ignores the fact. I would assume that he had some idea of this, but for some reason he ignores the fact that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He disregarded the well-being, the future well-being of his wife and his children for his cattle. No, you may not be here tonight as a herdsman with a bunch of cattle at home. 
But in principle, every one of us get faced with the same decision. You gotta make a you gotta make a choice for which direction you're gonna go. You you gotta make a choice for which direction your house is going to to live in. And are you going to make those decisions based on temporal things, what you see right now, and what would appear to be the most most beneficial right now? Adam Clark says this. A little civility or good breeding is of great importance in the concerns of life. Lot either had none or did not profit by it. He certainly should have left the choice to the patriarch and should have been guided by his counsel, but he took his own way, trusting to his own judgment and guided only by the sight of his eyes. He beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered, so he chose the land without considering the character of, it, of the inhabitants or what advantages or disadvantages it might afford him in spiritual things. This choice, as we shall see in the sequel, had nearly proved the ruin of his body, soul, and family. James, James said, Fawcett and Brown says that Lot chose him all the plain, a choice excellent in a worldly point of view, but most inexpedient for his best interests. He seems, though a good man, to have been too much under the influence of a selfish and covetous spirit, and how many, alas, imperil the good of their souls for the prospect of worldly advantage. What does it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his soul? And what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Lot is some well-watered plains that are readily available for your cattle. Is that the best choice for your kids? Is doing what's best for your cattle in the moment going to be the thing that's ultimately best for your kids? I know we got some guests here tonight, and we're so glad to have you. And but if you if you will just if nothing else, excuse me as I as I preach this evening to the people that I pastor, that I care for them and these children we are about to dedicate. But we we many of us, hopefully hopefully all of us in this place tonight, do not believe that abortion is is something that humans should do. But I will tell you, while we stay here, stand here tonight and may declare we do not believe in abortion naturally, unfortunately there's a lot of people that believe in or have practiced spiritual abortion. Because when God entrusted to me four kids 20 plus years ago over a course of several years, He was trusting me that lives that had potential for His kingdom Lives that might be able to make a difference of eternal significance. That I was going to be a good steward of those lives. And I wasn't going to put my personal interests and my personal desires ahead of what was best for them. He chooses the well-watered plains. One of the places throughout all of history... It appears to have been one of the most despicable. I know of no other time, I recall no other time in all of history where God rained fire down from heaven to destroy a city. It's never happened. Never happened before. I don't recall it since. I know that He destroyed the earth with a flood prior to that, but I, I don't know of another time we're out of judgment. God destroyed a city the way He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and God had watched what was going on in that city and He tolerated it for a period of time. But finally He decides enough is enough. Let it go on for long enough. I, I, I've let the sinfulness continue for long enough. I'm going to do something about it. And he gets ready to destroy the city and he decides he's going to, he's going to let Abraham know what he's going to do. I, I, I'm not going to go, go destroy the city and Lot and, and not tell my friend Abraham. Abraham starts to intercede on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham responds to God. He says, God, if, if I can find 50 righteous people in that city, will you, will you hold off judgment? 
God agreed. He, Abraham negotiated with God all the way down to ten. I'm convinced if God was willing to go from fifty to ten, He would have been willing to go down to one. If Abraham would have gone on and said, God, if I can find one righteous person in that city, would you hold off from destroying it? I don't know why God would have said yes all the other times and then said no to this one. But for whatever reason, Abraham stopped at 10, and so God is about to proceed with judgment. But he decides that before he does that, he's going to let Lot know. Angels. Not just, a, not just a prophet. Not just a man of God, but angels are sent to tell Lot what is about to happen. The, Bible's, the Bible tells us, gives us an insight to the despicableness of that city and that these two men, these angels came and, 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 and the men of the city wanted them for sexual pleasure and Lot is trying to protect them and, and then Lot actually offers his own daughters. And so... Genesis 19 and 1 says, There came two angels to Sodom at even, at evening. Now watch this. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. He, he wasn't in Sodom. He didn't live in Sodom. I read to you in the first verses I read, he just simply pitched his tent towards Sodom. He didn't live there. Wasn't engaged in the activities there. He, he just had his house in that direction. I got a question, I'm not talking about north, south, east, and west, as I realize you should know, but which, direct, which direction does your house face in? What is it that got everybody in your household's attention? He, he, he stayed out of Sodom, and, and again, I, I don't want to overread or overanalyze this verse, but if I just take at face value what it says, Lot sat at the gate. I, I think the implication is he, he realized, I, I don't need to be in that city. There's, there's, there's a bunch of mess in there. I, I, I'm trying to be a righteous man, so I'm just going to stay at the gate. The problem is this, while Lot may have stayed at the gate, his family didn't. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And, and they, they, they give him this warning. He takes, him, takes these angels to his house he, and, and they tell him what's coming and, and they say, is there anybody else around here besides you? You got any other family? So Lot goes and in, in verse number 14, I'm going to read it to you from the Living Bible. Lot goes to, to tell his, his children, his, his sons-in-law. Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancés, Quick, get out of the city for the Lord is going to destroy it. But the young men looked at him as though he had lost his senses. Twenty twenty three, it would be basically be like, yeah, whatever. What are you? What are you talking about? What are you? You lost your mind. God's going to destroy. What? What's wrong with you? Well watered plains for his cattle caused him to lose. Spiritual influence in the lives of his kids. I've watched beyond my years of pastoring, I've watched it in other roles of ministry where people have chosen natural things, prioritized natural things in their lives, prioritized natural things in the lives of their kids. 
and it never pays off. Oh, yeah, there's sometimes there is a season. There's a season, Brother Middleton, where it appears as though, but in the end, it never pays off. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's amazing, and I'm not against it at all. I've got a, I've got a bachelor's degree. A couple of my kids have them. Others are in college pursuing whatever. I, I, uh, we've got campus ministry. I'm all for education. But, but tell me what education guarantees you. How many thousands of people today have got bachelor's and master's and other degrees on a wall someplace working in a field that has nothing to do with their degree? But that's what happens when we want to put cattle above our kids. That's what happens when we want to choose the temporal things of life. I preached it, I think, last Sunday. Paul says, we look not at things at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Because everything that we see is temporary. It does not last. But there are some things that you can't see with a natural eye that are eternal. It is the things that are going to last. Lot, you got to get your family out. Judgment's coming. Somehow, somehow, he did manage to escape with his two daughters. Somehow. But he lost his wife. She had gotten so caught up in what was going on in Sodom again? Well, I don't know about you, but if I, if I was being told by an angel, leave the city, it's going to be destroyed, don't look back, because if you look back, it's not going to be good. I would not be wanting to find out. I don't know if I believe him or not, but we, we're not going to check it out right now. What was it inside of Lot's wife that was pulling on her enough that in spite of the warning from the angel, she just couldn't help herself but to look back? I don't know what would have happened if Lot would have given the decision back to Abraham to choose which direction to go, but I, I, there's something inside of me that thinks the story would have been different than this. And that the outcome of Lot and his family would have been different than this. You say, what are you saying, Pastor? You're saying we're not, you know, we're not supposed to, we're supposed to go, go buy a compound someplace and, and, and separate ourselves from the world. The only way you ask that question is if you haven't heard me preach much. Absolutely not. I, 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 I quoted it Thursday night. Jesus himself prayed. Father, I don't pray that you would take them out of the world. I pray that you'd keep them in the world. That's not, that's not my point. That's not, I don't think we're supposed to go hide away and just, just live some kind of survival life until Jesus comes. But the bottom line is we can exist in this world and have activities that are engaged in this world, but our focus and our heart not be this world. That my house is not pitching its tent towards Sodom. That I, I, I've got something else I'm focused on. I've got something else I'm looking for. And it is possible, it's possible because in contrast to the story of Lot and his children, if we go to Hebrews chapter 11, and verse number 23, the Bible says with regards to Moses, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches 
than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I don't know of anywhere in Scripture that gives it to us clearly. Maybe you have some understanding or insight on it. I, I don't know how long it was that after Moses was hid and, and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and adopts him and, and he is now a part of Pharaoh's household and, and, and then, and then his, uh, Pharaoh's daughter is looking for someone to nurse the child and Moses' sister comes and, and says, I know somebody and so Moses' own mother what a deal is that? You get paid to take care of your own kid. Moses' mother nurses the child and cares for him some length of time. My understanding is that could have potentially been up to several years. And in just a few years of the life of an infant to a toddler, something was instilled in that child. That even with Egypt and the best that Egypt had to offer him being at his fingertips. Egypt in scripture is a representation of the world. And so with the world and the best of the world, he was, he was raised in, with the finest of things. He ate the finest of food, wore the finest of clothes. He had the best educators in all of Egypt. He, he, he had the best of the best. While the people that were technically his parents were living in slavery, they were in bondage. But somehow, in that short period of time that Moses' mother cared for him, Something was instilled in him that when he reaches the point to have to make a decision, am I going to continue living as a part of Pharaoh's household and everything that that will afford me, or am I going to give that up and go back to my people? <laughs> Slavery, taskmasters. Bible says when he came to that place and made that decision, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I believe tonight Parents, and especially parents that are about to dedicate your children to the Lord tonight. I believe if you will make up your mind that you're not going to live your life making the decisions for your home and your family based on the cattle. What's, what's going what's gonna, to what's gonna afford us the best opportunities? What's going to afford us the best circumstances in life what's going to what's going to give me the best retirement option what's going to but if you will decide as Joshua said as for me in my house we will serve the Lord if you make that choice and you live that out to the best of your ability I believe you can have the hope that what Moses did is what your kids are going to do when they come to the point that it's time to make a decision. Yeah, there's a lot of glitz and glam that Egypt has to offer. There's a lot of pleasure that Egypt has to offer, but I know it doesn't look like the best option right now. I, I know it's not the best circumstances right now, but, but the people of God have got some promises. Egypt is, Egypt is experiencing the best that it's ever going to experience right now. But while the people of God may in, be in bondage and life may not be good for them right now, their future is one of hope. Their future is one 
that's going to have a good outcome. I know it's been said for, genera- or for, for decades now, maybe even generations. I know, it's, but it's been said for decades now, and I'm not so sure we're not becoming more and more numb to it, but if anybody's ever been living in the last days, I'm pretty sure we're as close as anybody's ever been. You may be an expert on the book of Revelation and all of the prophecies of the end times in there. But you don't have to have some in-depth understanding of the prophecies of Revelation to see we're in the the last days. All you got to do is go read what Paul said to Timothy. He said, in the last days perilous times will come. And he goes on to list several verses of things that would be indicators of the last days. (laughs) It doesn't take any effort at all to think of things that fit every single thing on that list that Paul gave Timothy. Every generation should have a motivation to choose the direction of its household and its future based on the spiritual well-being of the kids that live there. But I believe if there's ever been a time, that ought to be the case. If there's ever been a day and time in which families ought to decide, as for this house, as for this house, we're not going to be... We're not going to be drawn by the well-watered plains of Jordan that are next door to Sodom and Gomorrah. As appealing as that may be, as, as good of a situation that that may seem to be we're going to choose what is going to be best for the spiritual well-being of our household I'm going to uh, in just a moment I'm going to ask those that are here to have children to be dedicated to come but just just for a moment before I do that would you just bow your heads for just a second can I appeal to every mom every dad in this in this sanctuary right now would you, would you be willing to make a fresh commitment to the Lord tonight? Lord, as for me and my house, I don't care how good the well-watered plains of Jordan may look for my cattle. I don't, I don't care how good, it, how appealing it may be for my economic benefit, for my social well-being. God, I, I want what is going to be best for the, for the spiritual well-being of my home, my family. God, I want to go the direction that's going to best position my kids, not for their place in this world, not for their place in a career, not for their place in business or politics, but I I want to go the direction that's going to best position my kids for their place in your kingdom. Lord, if a part of their place in your kingdom is you, you put them in those positions and you use them in those places, that so be it, God. That's 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 your prerogative but I don't want that to be the thing that I prioritize and I pursue help us tonight God I pray for every household tonight that's a part of this congregation Lord no matter what ages the children are by your grace every family every household represented in this place tonight we'd have the wisdom and the guidance from your spirit to make the right decision on the direction that we live, the direction our our lives pursue, God. God, I believe that just as you were able to have something instilled in Moses at a very young age that would grow and develop into something strong enough to cause him to choose the right direction when the time came after 40 years of influence, 40 years of Egypt's voice, leading and guiding him there was something that had been instilled in him God that when the time came he made the right decision I believe that you can do that in the lives of these children we're about to dedicate in the lives of every child in this place every young person every young adult in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus name in Jesus name if you're here tonight and you've come for baby, your child to be dedicated, I want to invite you to come and any 
family or friends that have come specifically for that reason. We invite you to come and join them as well. If you'll just come and stand down front, we're probably going to have to spread out a little bit, I would imagine. I know we've got a, some of these children being dedicated have a good sized group with them. So I'm going to ask uh, the elders if you would come, please come stand down front. If you're a licensed minister, would you please come? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. If you guys don't mind, Ellen Berger, Black family, if you'll slide over some. We've got a couple of big crews here in the middle area. Praise God. Brother Barr, if you don't mind, please, would you, Brother Middleton, would you join him? Ask Brother Barr to anoint these children and the parents. And then as he does that, if you elders would then join and begin to pray. I'm going to ask the congregation, if you would, to stand. And as we begin to pray, if you would stretch your hand the direction of these children and these families and pray. Lord, we come to you tonight, God, again, not as not as a ceremony, not as a ritual, not just as something we do. This is the way we as apostolics do it. But God, we come before you tonight in faith. And as a demonstration of that faith, we present these precious children to you. God, you've given them to each one of these families. So tonight, Lord, we give them back to you, entrusting them into your care. Lord, in a world where sin is abounding, in a world where darkness is becoming gross darkness, I pray, God, that the light of your word, of your spirit, would lead and guide these children. That you would order their steps. That you would lead them in a plain path, God. I pray, God, that your purpose, your will for each one of their lives would be fulfilled, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray tonight, God, that you would dispatch angels to guard over them, watch them, keep them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that the seed of your word would be sown in each one of their hearts and lives, that it would produce, God, fruit in them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray tonight for each one of these parents. I pray, God, that you would impart wisdom and knowledge, understanding, grace and strength, Lord, that you would give them the grace to be the stewards of these lives that you have entrusted them, that they would help to nurture and protect, God, that the purpose for each one of these lives would be fulfilled, Lord, that just as you instructed Adam to guard and keep the garden that they would guard and keep these lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we believe you God for your grace and your strength in each one of these homes let your hand rest on each one of these lives Lord let your hand rest on each one of these children God I plead your blood upon them tonight Lord I plead your blood upon them tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that by your grace, our homes, our families would be focused toward you, toward your kingdom. 
toward your house, God, not the things of this world. That we would not be driven by worldly, natural ambition, but that we would be led and driven by a hunger and a passion for you, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord, your word promises that if we will train up our children in the way they should go, that when they are old, they will not depart. We lay hold of that promise. I claim that promise for each one of these families that are dedicating these children tonight, but I also claim that promise for every family in this church, Lord. Every child, God, that's been trained and nurtured in the ways of the Lord that according to your word, God, when they are old, they will not depart. And if they have wandered, if they have strayed away, that they will return, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We pray your blessings tonight. We pray your blessings tonight on every family in this place, Lord. We pray your blessings on every family in this place tonight, Lord. Every household in the name of Jesus. Every household in the name of Jesus, your blessings. Your blessing, your favor tonight, Lord. Your favor. Your favor is greater than every obstacle, every challenge in this world. It's greater, Lord. It's greater. You are greater. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Let your favor be on every home tonight, every family. Every generation, we pray your favor tonight, Lord. We pray for your favor tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Oh, yes. Let your presence go before us. Let your presence go before us. And we don't want to go anywhere that your presence is not, God. We don't want to go anywhere where your presence isn't, Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. Oh, thank you, Lord. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Hallelujah. You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Again, to everyone, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for being a part of this service. To all of our guests, we're so glad to have you tonight. God bless you. In Jesus' name.